Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology strategy videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing as I upload at least twice a week. Continuing on with our complete exploration of the core monster manual today, we combine two monsters into one video. Because one cannot talk about the Nightmare without talking about the Pegasus and vice versa as we shall find out. So. Grab yourself a beverage and a cheese snack, settle back and prepare to get deeply nerdy. Pegasi are fabulous creatures who are native to the outer plains of Arborea, which consists of three layers. Nearly all of the known realms of these plains exist on the first layer, where it is divided mainly between Olympus, home of the Greek pantheon, and Arvandor, domain of the elven Seldarim. The Olympians have almost nothing to do with the world of Toril and the Forgotten Realms, but the Seldarine are, of course, deeply involved. And it is mainly through the interactions across the plains by the Fey deities that the Pegasi have become known to the people of Faerun. On their home realms, the Pegasi are just as fabulous as they appear anywhere else, soaring through the crystal blue sky among the towering clouds, only touching down on the surface to feed, and when they take to their nests for rest and to raise their young. They uh, have live young, by the way, they don't lay eggs, although in the previous editions they did. Arborea is a multi-planar nexus. Through Olympus, it is possible to directly access Hades, Gehenna and Tartarus without passing through the astral plane. This becomes quite an important note in the second half of this video. Across Arvandor, large spinning crimson discs provide access to the neighbouring plains known as the Beastlands, or the Happy Hunting Grounds, also Gladsheim, and the concordant land that exists below the central spire of the multiverse and the interdimensional city, Sigil. Arborea guards all of its portals quite fiercely, with barriers and guardians. This plane is otherwise pretty wild. It is by its very nature a place of goodness and chaos, of freedom. Arborea is quite mountainous, quite mountainous, with deep chasms, huge passes and foothills so large the foothills are so large that people from Faerun would mistake them for mountains until they get a look at an actual mountain of Arborea and wonder if the peak is actually still covered in any air at all. Giant trees dot the rugged terrain while the flatter uh, parts of the terrain are covered with wild vineyards, or orchards and fields of wheat. I know that sounds a bit odd, but fields of grains and stands of fruit trees are the natural growth of this plain. But eventually they break into rougher terrain and wilder, much more dangerous wilderness. Monsters and evil beasts prowl these lands and provide a challenge to any who would go exploring. Overlooking this splendour are the majestic Pegasi, winged horses with feathered manes and lower parts of their legs, as well as huge wings that keep them aloft for most of the day. They are celestial creatures, they don't die of old age, though they are not immune to disease or injury and have no special resistance or miraculous healing powers. They are intelligent beings with a mind just as sharp as your average human. A wisdom of 15 reflects their superior senses, which they rely on as they speed across the sky and the land, stopping occasionally to munch on an apple or two. They have a charisma of 13, being beautiful to behold, and they are physically impressive with a strength of 18, dexterity of 15, a constitution of 16. So physically quite superior. A natural armor class of 12, thanks mainly to their agility, even as large creatures, and 7d10 or uh, plus 21, or between 28 and 91 hit points with an average of 59, so pretty tough. They can't speak, but can un understand anything said in Celestial, Elvish, and the Fey language of Sylvan, and a fair amount of common, and of course, they can communicate by whinnying, neighing, clopping their hoof and stuff. And in and of themselves, they're not built for fighting really. Sure, they're perceptive and fast, and their powerful legs can deliver a kicking hoof attack, which does is plus 6 to hit, and does 2d6 plus 4 bludgeoning damage, which is certainly enough to kill your average human if they're unlucky and get hit particularly hard. Pekasai are not aggressive though, they only fight to protect others, preferring to just leave the area far beneath or behind them. One of the hardest parts in dealing with them is this propensity to just take off at the slightest sign of bother. They are most desired steeds though, and in Arborea they often form close friendships with the immortal champions of Olympus, the likes of Heracles, Dardanus, Amphion, Orion, or Bellerophon, and of course the, uh, the Empyreans 
who can fly along with the Pegasi through the clouds and epic forest canopy, and of course, the Seldarine, including a fair few Eladrin and Celestial High Elves. The uh, Seldarine are known to send their aids to mortal elves, and rarely some other races, in the form of loyal Pegasi, noble and brave, who will provide swift transport and may also step in to valiantly protect and fight for those favoured by the elven powers. The Pegasi, as intelligent beings, have their own spiritual culture, and are particularly fond of three deities in particular. Uh, Ictian, meaning Lord of Horses, is the unicorn deity of healing, loyalty and protection. He's also a god of Pegasi. His symbol is a unicorn horn. Ictian is depicted as a winged unicorn with a white coat and light grey dappling on his belly. There is a grey fringe on his mane and beard. Ictian is a member of the Seely Court. Myths differ on his parentage, but most often he is regarded as the son of the Kirin god, Coriel. Sometimes he is said to be the offspring of Seldarine trickster gods, such as Erevan Elisir, who took on female form in order to conceive and give birth to Ictian. Side note, anyone who thinks elven gender fluidity is a new thing in D&D lore, <laughs> think again. The Seely Court is often located in Arborea, but is and has always been mobile across the Upper Plains. Part of this mobility is the steed of Queen Titania Ictian, and there is also Ictian's daughter with a uh, Selune named Leru, and also the uh, Unicorn Queen or the Queen of Talking Beasts. She is the adventurous and curious god that matches the temperament of the Pegasi quite well, so she um, is their god. Finally, there is Yathagera, the Winged Queen, a Pegasus demigoddess bound to Toril and the Prime Material Plane. She dwells on the island of Evermeet and appears in the form of a magnificent Pegasus with silver mane and rainbow-coloured wings. There is conflicting holy texts about her, so she could be the daughter of Ictian and the younger sister of LaRue. She could also be another aspect of LaRue that is worshipped among the elves. It's hard to say. Pegasi travel wildly and widely out of loyalty and a genuine desire towards goodness, which includes doing whatever one can help to help a friend. And this, sadly, is where they can run into terrible danger, including a fate most Pegasi consider to be worse than death. The celestial power that flows through the blood of the Pegasus gives greater power to their flight and inspires those who are near them. It comes from the heart and soul of the Pegasi. It is also um, what comes from their it comes from their wings. Much like the horn of a unicorn, the wings of a Pegasus contain special powers and many valuable alchemical and arcane properties. If a being of great evil manages to capture a Pegasus, they can drag it down in secret, if at all possible, to the deep gloom of Hades, and there perform a vile and cruel act so terrible that any being allied with the powers of light would be compelled to drop what they are doing and try their best to prevent it, or at very least, avenge it. The three layers, or glooms, of Hades are the literal midway, grey area of the D&D cosmos. They are realms devoid of emotion, hope, and peace. Grey land and grey sky. No sun or moon or seasons to break the monotony. Any colour other than shades of grey will leach away in a week or two. And likewise, beings begin to fade as well. At first they feel the drain of any positive emotions, leaving only sadness, ennui and defeatism. Eventually, even they lose all sense of identity, and their original physical and mental form becomes nothing more than a pathetic, mewling and wretched larvae. Into this horrid place, onto the first layer called Anthraxis, the Pegasus is mercilessly tortured and has its memories stripped away from it by the waters of the river Styx, which flows through this plain. This is done close to where the Styx transitions onward down into Tartarus and De Gehenna. So if need be, those, those perpetrating this crime can flee to the other planes of existence to escape justice, possibly taking the poor Pegasus with them. You can tell where the Pegasus, uh, where these places are because the portals look like huge spinning metal coins, visible for miles and surrounded by brooding iron fortresses, rife with diseases that are, that are native to this area and the demons are immune to. Not so the Pegasus, who has its mind and body ravaged by loss and pain. When they are already on the brink of death, they are revived by profane potions, which include a mixture of salt taken from the para-elemental plane of salt, as well as the flesh and blood of elves who have been murdered by forcing them to ingest demon flesh and ichor until it poisons them to death, slowly and painfully. This black and bubbling syrup is force-fed to the Pegasus, while a ritual circle is used to fill their blank and tormented mind with the psyche of a demon. This is not a quick 
process. It can take weeks to complete this mental transformation, and even then, it's not always completely successful over the long term. But when it's over, the final act ends the process and uh, is painful for any being with goodness or in their heart to witness. This is vile torture. And then, the wings of the Pegasus are torn and hacked from its twisted and tormented body, which causes it to ignite from the inside with something akin to hellfire that turns its pure heart into an engine of hatred. The light burns in the baleful gaze of the nightmare, and its body takes on the blackened, sleek, and flame wreath formed so different to what it once was. In some very, very rare cases, a nightmare can actually be trapped, restored, and nurtured back into close to what it once was, although the memory loss is permanent, as is the lingering effect of such a massive trauma. But there is some tiny hope that at least some nightmares can be healed. The lowest levels of Hades contains the base of Mount Olympus and is a direct conduit through the astral plane to the plane of Arborea. The grey motive of, the, of this place, called the Pluton, continues with vegetation of black willow trees and dry, dying poplars. The nightmares race through these bone-dry lands, setting ablaze, blazes that light up the perpetual overcast twilight. You could say that this is kind of their homeland. Once per decade, though, the nightmares gather to the first layer of Hades, called Oinos, uh, where they then set off in all different directions in order to race across the plains and many different worlds to call other beings of great evil to the gloom meet, a gathering of lower planar creatures to plan evil deeds. The nightmares have the job of spreading the word of the gloom meet. It's unclear why this is or what compels them. However, a great many nightmares, if they can manage it, will return to Hades, mortally wounded, to stagger up into a distinctive pile of old nightmare bones, and then die, decaying quickly to join the grisly mound. Some think that the skulls, uh, some think that the skulls of the dead nightmares call out to their living brethren and call them back to begin the gloom meets. There also seems to be some sort of cycle of progress and growth for the nightmare that has nothing to do with food or water, but has a lot to do with the the transformation process of the Pegasus on via pain and torture and suffering. So that the nightmares, having been transformed by evil, now feed on evil itself. There are regular nightmares and there are kushima, uh, which um, are bigger, huge instead of large, but otherwise quite similar. There is a lot of D&D edition history behind the Nightmare. Personally, I am very much in favour of the latest incarnation. They are transformed, artificially pulled down into the lower realms rather than fallen celestials. They are forced into becoming fiends just to survive such a brutal torture. Unlike previous editions, the fiendish Nightmares can't teleport or breathe a cone of smoke and cinders. However, in relation to their deadly transformation, they kind of exist between life and death able to tra traverse it at will directly into the ethereal plane. That is the afterlife, folks. The realm of spirits, ghosts, the dead, and sometimes the undead. They can take up to three other willing beings with them, and it's not that easy to gain the services of the Nightmare as an ally, let alone a riding mount. First, they are evil. I mean, really evil. The preferred diet is living humanoids, elves and humans being top pick on their menu. But they don't actually have to... They have no need for food. They feed on evil itself. So for them, serving an evil being is literally more tasteful than any other option. They require a living, intelligent humanoid victim, which they will murder and eat before they even consider what a good or neutral creature that some of them has to say. If they are magically compelled into servitude, they make it highly unpleasant to be around them. If you can picture them crouching down in their haunches, front legs extended out in front like a cat, their head reared back and slightly to the side, mouth of, wide, of, of large fangs wide open, and a shrieking scream like a venting steam valve, piercing the area at full volume with air-splitting warble like the furious neighing of a horse. That's how they react to being forced to do something for, the, for a good creature. They may not always lash out violently, but they sure as hell seem like they're about to do any second. Also, they're on fire. In the monster manual, it says that the nightmare can confer fire resistance, so half damage and ill effects from fire and heat to anyone riding it. Can, but won't unless they want to. Now look at the hoof damage from a nightmare kick. They're also plus 6 to hit and do 2d8 plus 4 bludgeoning damage, but also inflict 2d6 fire damage. Now guess how much damage you'll take if you try riding, grabbing, noosing, or just standing too close to a nightmare who doesn't grant you fire resistance. 
and his flaring its flaming mane, breath, gaze, tail, and searing odd hooves with furious anger. Yeah, 2d6 fire damage per round. You might want to reduce that to 2d4 per round to creatures and flammable objects who are not actually touching any of the flaming bits, but still, if it would, um, it's rearing up and screaming in waves of shimmering heat, shedding bright light out to 10 feet and dim light out to 20 feet. They can back this heat off a lot, giving off deep smoky red flames that don't really burn that much. When they take off into the air though, they are almost jetting heat in a very controlled way from their hooves and tail. For riders they allow on their back, or up to three individuals at a time, they back that heat down so that they can, uh, those on them are not bothered by it. Nightmares are beyond mean and malicious. Even with those they consider suitably evil, they are still really nasty. Given any opp opportunity to be a total dick, they will do it. And I advise you to be really creative in this regard. Player characters who have nightmares as their uh, companions or in their captivity should just hate these things. Nightmares have the same intelligence and mostly the same stats as a pegasus. They have a lower wisdom because they have senses that are not as sharp as they once were. They've lost their plus 6 to perception checks and have a lower wisdom of 13 instead of 15. But they are now totally immune to fire and a bit tougher with an armor class of 13 and 8d10 plus 24 or between 32 and 104 hit points with an average of 68. A small increase and the speed on land and air of the nightmare is exactly the same as that of the Pegasus. They have a slightly high charisma because they're more intimidating. Being able to move in and out of the ethereal plane and take others with them is a huge difference though. First of all, the ethereal is a transitive plane that borders almost all the other planes of existence. Fifth edition tells us, and I quote, the ethereal plane is a misty, fog-bound dimension. Its shores, called the border ethereal, overlap the material plane and the inner planes, so that every location on those planes has a corresponding location on the border ethereal plane. Visibility in the border ethereal is limited to 60 feet. The plane's depths comprise a region of swirling mist and fog called the deep ethereal, where visibility is limited to 30 feet. From the border ethereal, a traveller can see into whatever plane it overlaps, but that plane appears muted and indistinct, its colours blurred into each other and its edges turned fuzzy. But still, they can see what's going on. Ethereal denizens watch the plane as though peering through a distorted and frosted glass, and can't see anything beyond 30 feet into that other plane. Conversely, the ethereal plane is usually invisible to those on the overlapping planes, except by the aid of magic. Normally, Creatures in the border ethereal can't attack creatures on the overlap plane, and vice versa. They're separated. The traveller on the ethereal plane is invisible and utterly silent to anyone on the overlapped plane, and solid objects on the overlap plane don't hamper the movement of a creature in the border ethereal. They just move straight through it like it's a hologram. The exceptions are certain magical effects, including anything made of magical force and living beings. This makes the ethereal plane ideal for reconnaissance, spying on opponents, and moving around without being detected. The ethereal plane is also disobeys the laws of gravity. A creature can move up and down, side to side, as easily as walking. Visitors to the deep ethereal are engulfed by a roiling mist. Scattered throughout the plane are curtains of vaporous colour. These are the barriers between different planes of existence. Passing through a curtain leads a traveller to a region of the border ethereal connected to the specific inner plane, or the prime material plane, or the Feywild, or the Shadowfell. The colour of the curtain indicates that the plane whose border ethereal the curtain conceals. Of course, that's not open knowledge to everybody. Now, I'm not a rules lawyer, but it just says, and I quote, the nightmare can enter the ethereal plane. Uh-huh. Border or deep ethereal? I say either, and this is totally amazing for the power it gives to getting around the multiverse. No wonder the nightmares are the instant messenger service of the forces of darkness. They're like infernal Twitter. So obviously, these are the preferred mounts of very powerful agents of evil. Baylors, pit fiends, demigods, death knights, night hags, vampire lords, Lord uh, Rakshasa, ultraloths, succubi, mesodemons, and so on. On clouds of noxious sulfur and streaking flashes of its incandescently hot hooves, the nightmare slips in and out of reality itself, into the domain of the dead and back again, from one plane of existence to the other. They can flash around like Nightcrawler from the X-Men. They can drift right beside someone, watching them through the ethereal mist, spying on them and relaying the information back across the multiverse to the forces of darkness. They do it out of spite. They do it because they want to instigate pain, loss, suffering and death. They will start wars if they can. They will incite murder, sow distrust, foment dissent in any way that they can think of. 
it's a good thing that they're not more intelligent than they really are, really, because they do tend to gravitate towards beings who have a much more devious mind, though probably equally depraved. In previous editions, those who have had close and unwelcome encounters with the nightmares have very disturbed sleep for a long while after. I like to think this is some part of the Pegasus screaming through the ethereal for help and release from its endless torment. They just want to properly die and be released back to the upper planes. But the thing that their physical form has become is a terrible anchor that they can't break free from. The soul of the Pegasus no longer recognises the thing it's become. It can't remember who it was or what happened to it. It doesn't know how to fix itself and so it just screams, silent, invisible, on the very edge of the deep unconscious mind, only detectable as equally deep and disturbing dreams. It's a very fitting name, the Nightmare. Those of you who really want to f uh, a flip side of the Nightmare, there are creatures very similar to Nightmares but are not evil. In Setting Saintly Standards in Dragon Magazine number 79, St. Bane, the Scourger, rides a white beast sharing the characteristics of a nightmare, but which is of neutral good in alignment, and um, another in the Dancing hat, Hut of Baba Yaga, which glows brilliantly white like the sun. This is the uh, Steed of Light, one of the personifications of primal energy that Baba Yaga has captured as part of her plan to permanently evade death. Sounds a lot like an elemental of the positive energy plane to me, but it has a horse-like form and it's on fire. The Dragon number, uh, Dragon Magazine number 277, the new champion of Zental Keep, Skylua Darkhope, also rides a white nightmare called uh, Targarine, but is still an evil creature with just a strange pigment, including bright blue flames. I see absolutely nothing wrong with making all sorts of variations on the nightmares because they're not natural creatures by any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, engage yours and come up with a different twist on the creation process and extrapolate ways that could alter how their nightmare turns out. Some different form of torture, some different uh, kind of torment which twists and shapes the nightmare into a different type of creature. Hades rides a chariot pulled by four nightmares. Vecna has a few. Nerul has some very huge, powerful versions. I imagine Bane has a mounted cavalry of them. Asmodeus is even known to ride them. And the Nine Hells is a kind of a pony express with imps riding nightmares to deliver things super quickly, with the imps serving the whims of more powerful masters. Uh, Nazugon Devils, first seen in 3rd edition Manual of the Plains, are also shown riding nightmares. One of the most powerful hags in the D&D history was uh, Malagardi, the hag countess, appointed by Asmodeus to rule over the hellish lair of, of Malbolg for a time. The Fiendish, Co Fiendish Codex 2 notes that Asmodeus' daughter Glazia took over control of Malbolg from the hag countess. Um, after she was destroyed. She also tried to co-opt the hag Steed, a monstrous nightmare named Blood Curdle. Although this initially uh, pre pretended to accept the new mistress, it then threw Glasner into the wake, one of the lakes of bile. <laughs> As a consequence, uh, Blood Curdle now faces a grueling schedule of torments each day, but that's just a lot for a nightmare. He's still being tortured by Glasnier in 4th edition, by the way. Speaking of torments, nightmares hate the river Styx. They have, uh, they have to be blindfolded and constrained before they'll even get on a vessel travelling on the black waters, understandably. Oh yeah, the Githyanki keep a stable of nightmares with great difficulty, and uh, a lot of not-so-random outbreaks of fire plague their camps. The, um, it's interesting to note that in the stables of those nightmares, there's troughs of like molten rock but it's unknown whether the nightmares actually eat that or they it's just a side effect of um, them being around dragon number dragon magazine number 95 mentions that the blood of a nightmare is one of the several potential components required to make a liquid capable of magically preserving cockatrice tail feathers so nightmares still have blood also here as some spells require a miniature rope of braided hairs from the mane of a nightmare as their material component, and these hairs can also be spun into a nightmare thread by skilled hags, with which they stitch together the animated scarecrows, and burning some of the nightmare thread will temporarily give whoever holds the burning filament a terrifying aura similar to dragon fear. In a pinch, a bit of nightmare hoof can also be used in casting the phantom steed spell, as well as the planner ally spell. Believe it or not, there are there's loads more information on the nightmare. They really do get around and appear in all the different settings for the game over its decades of history. But for now, 
that is all from me. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts of these videos. Buy some merchandise. Wear your geek with pride. Check out Patreon Blades for a mighty smooth shave. Catch me on the weekends for a live stream and we can talk about all stuff D&D. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.